than a fetlock joint. I'll show that to you. Had less, were less performers. And thesiophyte formation on proximal sesamoid bones, it's basically spurs on sesamoid, performed less um, than the other counterpoint horses. And then proximal dorsal fragmentation of hind fetlock. So chips, dorsal T1 chips are in the front of the joint in a hind ankle affected performance. We really think the reason that is is probably many of them weren't taken out, and I'll go over that later. And then dorsal medial intercarpal joint disease, which is basically lower joint of the knee. And a lot of us know that that is something that seems to definitely affect performance. So first, I'm, all the normals are going to be, I think we need more lights down. I, Can you guys see that chip? Well, I haven't. Okay. There you <laughs> Thank go. you. Okay. Um, I can't see that on a good So time. this is the fetlock joint. Here's the cannon bone. Here are your sesamoids. <laughs> this is T1 or your long pasture and bone. And so this is your fetlock joint. This is normal. The screen on the right. This is a dorsal T1 chip. You see right here this, this chip of bone. Can everybody see that? Okay. Um, these are very common in yearlings, especially in hind limbs. In racehorses, you see them a lot more in, in the front limb. But they do very well with removal. We um, did a study in 2000 where we looked at over 461 of these, and about a quarter of these were yearlings. And they raced very well afterwards, about 90% of them. Equal to their siblings. Equal to their siblings. So once you take out a P1 chip, it's as good as the rest. And I mean, the rest of the study looked at racehorses, too. Once you take out an ankle chip, they're just as good as they were before if you don't have any other disease in the ankle. There were just a, if you won a stake before, your odds of being a stake horse were just as good as the comparison uh, before. So. And then my question's always been, and a lot of you will ask me the same thing, oh, it's a, it's a tiny chip in a hind ankle. Well, you go back to that study, and hind ankle chips did affect them. And I think you know, they didn't have any data on whether surgery was done on these horses. And oftentimes, in a hind limb, people will say, eh, it'll never bother them. I think that study kind of shows that, yeah, they do. And my question is always, so does size really matter on the chip? And the answer is no, doesn't matter. The joint responds pretty much the same, whether it's a big chip or a, a small chip, because what happens is it's not that the chip fracture has no blood supply. So what gets you into trouble with an ankle chip, people think of it as like having a rock in your shoe, so you take the rock out and it doesn't hurt. That's not what causes the joint to gradually degenerate. It's this parent bone, which you can kind of see here under where that chip was. It tries to heal the chip back. If you could convince it not to heal the chip back, you'd be fine. And sometimes, especially with big chips that happen as full, you'll find joints where there's actually a joint between the chip and the parent bone. But if you have a small piece of bone that's moving in relation to the, to the parent bone, you're going to be shedding debris into the joint because of the uh, biomechanics of that trying to heal it back and really a pretty good indicator while you're training is if you got fluid in the joint in the ankle anytime you got fluid in the joint that joints responding to the fact that there's a mobile piece of bone in that joint and and as Debbie said those radiographs that were used for that retrospective study were they actually from Dr. Moorhead's practice he has a high pr uh, proportion had back then. This was the last segment of time before the repository. And at that time, before the repository, those horses that had the chips in the ankles, the front ankles came to us or to Haggard's or to Peterson and Smith and had the front ankle chips taken out. But by and large, the trainers left the hind ankle chips in. So consequently, that happened in between the evaluation of the radiographs and, the fat and their um, racing career. Consequently, the data showed hind ankle chips mattered, front ankle chips didn't. But it's because the front ankle chips had all gotten taken out. So it led to the um, knowledge that hind ankle chips were important as well, because those horses raced less well than their siblings. And then we also have what's called a plantar P1 chip. We have the normal on the left here. Here's your sesamoid, distal cannon, P1. And in this joint over here, you actually see this large fragment that's on the top of P1, right underneath the sesamoid here. And we know these do very well with surgery, but how often do you take them out and do you, do you always recommend removal on these? Well, here I think you're going to get, this is an opinion because there's not strong data on 
this, but size matters here. What, what happens here is the horse pulls this piece of bone off while he's uh, young and still growing. The piece of bone has a blood supply, so it keeps growing. The place where it came from has a blood supply, so it heals in. So all of a sudden, you got a piece back here under the sesamoid where no, there's no room to go. There's no place for it to go. So when you start training, it, this often will start to irritate either the base of the sesamoid or the back of the cannabone. It, it, it rarely does P1, but occasionally it does. These, these horses, the trainers with of these horses are telling you things like, this horse gallops with his head off to the side all the time, and he's not really lame, but he's just not right, and those sort of things. And it's a size game. Because if you have a little tiny one that's down here, probably ought to buy that horse. It's probably not going to bother him. But if you got one this size, it's up in the joint. You can get rid of them. They don't bother the horse once you take them out. This is a lot like plucking a stone out of your shoe. Once it's gone, it's gone. Okay, and then next we have a plantar eminence fracture. I'm sure a lot of you have heard those before. The same, same theory where you have this fragment of bone off the back of P1, this is a large, this part is not articular down here. There is an articular fragment up here. Most of these heal, the majority of them heal. Um, a lot of them will heal with a fibrous union versus a bony union. I, I would say more heal with a bony union than fibrous. But this is something that gets discounted significantly at sales because it still has that fracture line when in fact these usually do very well in racing. Would you agree? No, totally agree. It's hard, it's very hard to sell one of these horses. Now you ought to buy these because, <laughs> because that thing doesn't bother. Now this, this is in the joint right there, but that piece is not. That's one of the collateral ligament attachments. You'll never see those fractures in a broodmare because eventually the fibrosis, I, don't know, I shouldn't say never, 99% of these will be gone. You might occasionally find a broodmare with one, but they get a fibrous union, as Debbie said, but they don't heal before sale time. A lot of times they're still there. So it still looks like a fracture, and people are like, oh, he has a fracture in his ankle. I you know, just can't do it when actually most of them do very, the majority of them do very well. Yes, not part of the joint. You can stand these. If you have something in the joint, you might have to take that out, but you don't have to take this out. The horse does fine with those. Okay. And then next we have apical sesamoid fractures, and I'll try to not put the little circle up right away so you guys can kind of figure out what's going on. but. Um, normal on the left, and this is the apical sesamoid fracture. The, the sesamoid, the apex is here, the abaxial surface is here, and then the base you'll often hear us talk about is down here. So here's a fragment off the apex of the sesamoid. And um, actually, we've done a fair bit of research on this. Um, Dr. Snobble with Dr. Bramlage looked at these, and they do very well. And they even do well, um, all the hind ones did well, the front end, the medial fronts were the ones that affected performance. and I mean, do you have anything to add as far as? No, I mean, this is where you really got to know your homework because this is where um, a fracture is not, a fracture is a fracture is a fracture. I got a sesamoid fracture, they discounted it. They didn't, they shouldn't have done that because they're normal. There, if a horse breaks a front, uh, inside sesamoid on a front limb, whether he's a racehorse or a yearling, it affects him long term. If they break, an apical sesamoid fracture like this. In any other of the six sesamoids, they're fine. In fact, they raced better than their siblings did, so you should go buy them. <laughs> but then we also, then we're trying to figure, okay, so why are these medial ones, why are they more significant? Why don't they do as well? So then um, Dr. Bramlage did this study where they looked at the size and the geometry, and, and there is a little bit different shape on those medial ones in front oftentimes. Where they and don't. But size didn't make a difference. No. But the suspensory is so much more important on the medial sesamoid than the front limb that it, it, that's what made the difference. They usually, sesamoid fractures fail because the suspensory that's left fails. Okay, and the next, um, I just wanted to show you that not all sesamoid fractures are created equal. This is an abaxial sesamoid fracture. And this is where the, this is your sesamoid. The suspensory t attaches all through here. And the meat of it attaches where this fragment is, or the abaxial um, fracture. And on a medial fronts, we're very concerned about these, but many of these will involve the suspensory, so you have to, these are more concerning, and you don't always know how much suspensory is involved when you're looking at them. So 
I mean, and they're also very easy to miss on radiographs, I think. I mean, these, this is the one I always will give to interns or people that are starting to read films and, and rarely do people pick this up because it, it just, the sesamoid just looks abnormal, but it's not this big fragment sticking out there that is very visual because it's through the sesamoid. But um, again, these would be concerns. I know we've had one, I sent you the horse to try to get that out. It was a big, bigger piece than that. It was farther back, yeah. It was a farther back, but, and it ended up was a very nice racehorse. I mean, typically are those these bad? They're bad. Yeah. Well, hit, hit that one you're talking about. That Probably one. a good exactly. thing I didn't get it all out of there. <laughs> 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 now, this, as Debbie said, they're right in the meat of the suspensory ligament, and most of the time um, they take too much suspensory with them. Coincidentally, they all they are by far most frequent in the medial sesamoid of a front limb. Okay, now we're going to, there's also non-articular base sesamoid fractures. Here's a normal sesamoid on the left here, and then here's a fragment off the base. Now this is not articular. The articular portion of the sesamoid is basically in this proximal third or going towards the front of the joint in this third, and then there's two ligaments that attach in the middle and then on the back of the sesamoid, and when these fragments pull off, they're pulled off with a ligament. And actually, Dr. Wellman did a study on this with Dr. Bramlage, and they looked at these as yearlings and they had as many starts as their siblings, but they made less money, so they were less quality horses. And the problem with these is when they become clinical, there's just not a lot we can do. It's not like we can go in the joint and pluck it out like we could on a chip and that's articular. So they can be more concerning. I'm kind of more concerned about size. If it's a larger one, I'm more concerned than if it's a smaller. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong in, in thinking that. I mean, this, we couldn't have enough to really evaluate size in this study. Really, if you're gonna look at how much these affect horses. There have been a few really good horses with these in there, but the ultrasound is your tool to see how, how much of the distal sesamoidian and ligament is involved, because unlike the P1 chip where I was talking about, the problem is the joint's trying, to, the bone keeps trying to heal it back and it sheds debris in the joint. This isn't in the joint, doesn't shed any debris. If you want to race the horse yourself, I would recommend you not go after that piece. Because what hurts the horse is the loss of ligament, as Debbie said. And in order to get that piece, you gotta cut some more ligament free. So if you just wanna make a pretty set of radiographs, you can cut that out. But if you're actually after trying to keep a sound horse, and, and they're useful horses. I mean, they're, they're, you, they're worth training but they're not quality horses when they have this. They can't stand the training like a, a horse without one of those is. And they, they typically will significantly affect your sales price because of that. People are gonna put value on, you know, I know this horse isn't gonna race as well or when it gets sore, I may be done. So there, it will significantly affect your value. Next we have a proximal sagittal ridge OCD of the fetlock. The sagittal ridge is this, um, is right around here, you see that thinner area bone, it's a little bit lighter shade. You can see over here, same thing, and then you have a fragment at the top. And this is probably a good time to go over really what truly is an OCD. We hear about OCDs that heal. Are they, were they a true OCD or were they really just osteochondrosis? And I'll let Dr. Bramlage explain. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> OCDs don't heal because OCD is Latin for osteochondritis, it uh, means bone, cartilage, desiccans, which means flap. The lesions that have inflammation of bone and cartilage, but no flap that you haven't separated, should be called osteochondrosis, or it's, it's actually OC, not OCD. Once you have a desiccans lesion, meaning you have a free piece, they're not gonna heal back. So we see places in the stifle we see places in other places in the fetlock, which Debbie will show you, where if the flap never forms, the bone will eventually mature and be okay. So here's one that, you know, we talk about mid-sagittal ridge lucencies. I'm sure many of you guys have heard those on your reports. So this is normal, where that sagittal ridge right here, sorry, is all nice and smooth, all the same um, density. And then you get over here and it gets real lucent or inflamed. Lucent when bone becomes inflamed, it loses its mineral content because it loses its strength. And that is why it looks more lucent here. 
And people can be critical of these, but the majority of these will mature away. And a lot of us will say that. We'll say lucency mid schedule ridge, most resolve with maturity, because the vast majority of them do. I think a lot of two-year-old people will often, I mean, don't you think that, Scott? A lot of two-year-old people will often kind of shy away from them just because they're worried about, are they going to mature enough for me to press on with them and work against the calendar? So um, I think it does affect some of those. But typically, if they're inflamed like this, this will affect your sales thumb when really these are, again, a one to buy because. And your, your common, uh, you hear commonly uh, veterinarians describe this as OCD, and it's really not. Right. If it does have a desiccance, it's no secret because when they break free, the ankle gets big and there's a ton of fluid. So if you happen to be unlucky and be in the 2% or so that, um, that doesn't mature away, it, you're, you're going to know it because the ankle that sheds lots of debris when they come free. And then this is the picture. I just want to show you this one like on, on two different views of what we're seeing here. This is on the front to back view. So here are your two sesamoids, here's the cannon bone, here is the sagittal ridge. That groove of bone we're seeing out there is actually this ridge here. And then here's T1. So this is one that has just an extreme amount of lysis in the bone. And then if you come over here to the side, I mean you can see that other one was so white and nice and smooth. This one looks like it has big flaps up here. But she healed and she healed completely, even though this, I mean I would even have a hard time recommending purchasing this. So that happened to be our own horse, and we ended up having to go. We went to a two-year-old sale with her. It, it, it has to carry weight. You can't get away from the, the, the situation that that has to carry weight for the horse. So if it's that much demineralized bone, it's much more vulnerable than if it's smaller. So it is a matter of degree. Okay, okay next we have fetlock, lucencies, or cysts. Now, we talk about, let me just show you what it is. So here you see the distal cannon bone, sesamoids, T1, and these are the condyles that we are already talking about with, say, a medial condyle lucency. Here is one where we have this subchondral, which means in, within the bone, like deep below the articular surface, we have this subchondral bone lucency. This just would be a cyst. Some of the cysts, depending on location and size, might be okay. Maybe they're in the front of the joint versus the back where most of the weight is born. But this one's really on the meat of the condyle or the heavy weight-bearing surface. And, and this would be a concern at sales, and rightfully so. Any? No, I mean, it, a lot of them, majority of them are okay. They eventually mature when good. But when they fail, they fail spectacularly, and there's no backup. You just lose the horse. So that's why people are justifiably concerned. As Debbie said, it's a matter of size and how likely is it to mature away. Okay, and now this is the big bag of worms, the sesamoiditis. This is the most common and the most confusing radiographic um, change that there is in yearlings. And, and actually, that's why I did this study. This was the first study I did because it was when I started reading films, and I'm like, how do we actually define sesamoiditis? There's such a varying opinion on what sesamoiditis is, and so I tried to define it. And this is a normal sesamoid here on the left. You can see a vascular canal here. That's normal. And then... You go to the right here, this is what's considered an enlarged vascular canal, from my definition um, in my study, which is non-parallel borders. See how they come out here and they're kind of club-shaped? And then they also have this caudal border, or a border on the back. So it's almost like a, a club shape in there. Now vessels coming into a sesamoid bone are normal. They, they have that and they, they, that's where they get their vasculature. But when they become enlarged like this is what we defined a sesamoiditis and we looked at the number of canals and it affected them. Two enlarged canals affected them at two, but not three. Three or more affected them at two and three in starts and earnings. They still raced. Like in that group, there were 70% of them raced at three. But the other, the, the control group, 85% of them raced at three. So it was a significant decrease. So again, it's putting value on an animal and are you going to be able to give it time? But the reason why sesamoiditis is so critical, because again, that's where the sensory attaches that we had, you know, we had talked about that. But there's a few other things, and there's such a variance, and it's just not all in large canals. If you look, there's a little bit of a lucency deep here, kind of where the abaxial sesamoid fracture was, and that, again, is right where the meat of the sensory attaches. So how is the sensory in this picture? That's what the concern is. 
So here's just some varying degrees of sesamoiditis, and I just kind of wanted to get people's opinion about what you, what do you guys think about these different, I mean, here's an enlarged canal, 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 canal. Here we have kind of a large canal, we have some proliferation, and when we talk about that the suspensory is actually pulling on it, and you have some proliferation of the bone, that's what we see is this little prominence right here. I mean, both of these, and usually with these ones that are prominent, you'll see a thickened suspensory, even on the radiograph. You can tell that the soft tissue is thick, so you know the suspensory is not going to scan normally. But these are the ones that, when they don't have that, often you could have significant amount of enlarged canals, and your suspensory <coughs> could still be okay at this point. So, yeah, um, we scan so many of these as a sale, and that's the, that would I'd pose a question to Dr. Bramley's. What if the scan is normal on these yearlings, they, like so many are? What, how do you? Um, and I know kind of what I think, but I want to know what you think and as far as well, they how they scan. I, th I think it, it somewhat depends on what you define as a normal scan. If the, or, um, if the quality of the bone is good, which I don't think, as Debbie's already pointed out, the quality of this bone is not very good in either one. The suspensory attachment is what's diseased, and that's the bone on the one side, the suspensory on the other, and the connection in between. And any one of those three can be the link in the chain that fails. And so you have to look at um, the quality of the bone. If it just has a, a couple of slightly irregular canals and the quality of the bone is good and the suspensory scan is fine, you take it because the whole unit is in pretty good shape. It's the, to, to give you an idea of the variation, even how veterinarians interpret sesamoiditis, remember the first study that Debbie showed you with Al Kane doing all those uh, yearlings that they used Dr. Moorhead's bill? Sesamoiditis just didn't make it as a significant finding. When people quote that, they didn't make it as a significant finding. The way he defines sesamoids is any abnormal, sesamoiditis canals is any abnormality in the lucency of the canal. Here's where you need some judgment because the entrance of the vessels into the bone is often a little bit um, funnel shaped. And in that study, that was counted as an abnormal sesamoid. That's why the incidence in that study was over 70% of sesamoiditis. And his severe sesamoiditis was 34%, mine was 2%. So there's a big difference in Big difference, 15% in your study roughly, for right? The, for the one and two enlarged canals, and it was only 2% for the three or more enlarged canals. 2% for the three or more. See, so real sesamoiditis is not all that common. But when you've got it, you really have to look at it. These canals are markers for previous disease. You guys all know which ones of your horses are going to have sesamoiditis. They're the foals that had problems with their suspensories and with their ankles whenever they got turned out in the first month of life. You can almost count on those horses having sesamoiditis. Foals who injure their suspensories, attachments to the sesamoids, either the, sometimes they'll pull the suspensory off, sometimes they'll break them and displace them. If they break them and stay in close apposition and heal, um, very quickly. Lots of foals break sesamoids. I mean, it's very common injury. Most of them, you don't even know it happens unless you're x-raying them to put screw in their ankle or something. Um, but if you have a significant enough problem that you have a lame foal, you've got pretty high odds that you're going to have sesamoiditis on his yearling films. It's a marker that there was inflammation there and something has damaged the suspensory insertion. So it's a real problem. The question becomes, where do you draw the line? And that's the art of veterinary medicine. So you, you have to have some concept of what's in the horse as opposed to just what's on the film. And when we looked at sesamoiditis as well, horses that had it in all their limbs were better than horses that just had it in the front or just had it in the hind or just had it in one limb. So if it was more generalized, it was better too, the prognosis is. Which would make sense along with you know what happens with foals. I think injury. those are the weak foals, the ones that have it in all their limbs. You know, I well, think those okay are just then. the weak folks. Yeah, they come up. They come up and they do okay because they never really get serious injury. So wh when will you start seeing radiographic abnormalities in those foals? Well, um, you start seeing it just as the, se the thing is healing. But the thing, the sesamoid gets bigger and bigger. So a, a sesamoid uh, triples in size from those foals. And half of a full sesamoid is still cartilage. It's still rubber. So it'll be when that 
cartilage um, template mineralizes, then you can start to see the effect. It mineralizes gradually during their life. I mean, they're growing. That's why a broken sesamoid in a foal heals so much better than a broken sesamoid in an adult racehorse has a really terrible time healing. It has no periosteum. It's under tension all the time. It's a high motion place. All the stuff you, you list whenever we're talking about how this is a hard factor to heal, it's, it's all there in a sesamoid. But a foal is still growing, so it's not a big leap for a foal to patch in a hole. And if they break them and they stay in reasonable contact, they'll, they'll heal, they'll fill them in. Even if they stay somewhat close, they heal, but then as a yearling, you get a big long sesamoid. Because he had a gap in there and he filled it in with bone because he was still growing. Okay. okay, and then we also have another form of sesamoiditis, and you'll see these on my report sometimes where I talk about trauma on the palmar plantar sesamoid, so on the back of the sesamoid, and it's just that. It is on the back. See how this sesamoid has this nice rounded appearance? This is normal. And you get here, it almost looks like it has this big chunk out of the back of the sesamoid. These ones, actually when you scan them, this one was scanned and the suspensory branch was completely normal because it's actually mostly behind the suspensory branch. And these typically do well, but on sales, they often are discounted significantly because people are concerned just because it looks so ugly. And it does look ugly. I mean, you can see the difference in these sesamoids, I hope, in this big chunk that's out here and this one, but actually these in my study did very well. They were normal. Buy these, they're worth the money. <laughs> because because it doesn't, in, it doesn't involve any of the really important attachments. It's kind of on the back. And this, this tends to be a yearling trauma, not a baby trauma. I agree, yep. It's hard the yearlings to, often do this to themselves. It's hard to sell these too. Yep. Yep. And they usually look worse before they look better when they happen because they're healing. And I told you I'd tell you what supracondylar lysis was, and that um, is something that was significant in that study, but really what supracondylar lysis means to me, and I think to many of you guys, is really there's got to be something else going on in that joint because th see how this tannin bone gets very narrow here, right above the fetlock joint, and this is a normal one. You see how skinny that gets? That's an indicator for chronic inflammation, and actually this horse has a cyst and some joint capsular reactions, so there's a reason for the supracondylar lysis. I mean, on, on report, if it's moderate or severe, I will mention supracondylar lysis. I often wonder how significant it is if everything else on the joint looks normal. I feel like I need to mention it because of the study that showed that it was significant, but on mild cases, mild to moderate, I'm not really going to say much if I don't see anything else. Is that fair? No, I think you got to look for what was the previous problem. The previous problem totally heals. See, the reason they get supracondylar lysis is all the blood vessels that supply the bottom of the cannon bone go in the bone right there. They go in in front of the fetlock joint capsule into the epiphysis. There's a whole bunch of holes right here where the blood vessels go in. So if there was a serious need for healing or inflammation in that bone, that increased blood supply, blood supply absorbs bone as the inflammation is occurring. So you get this waste that Debbie's talking about. So it means what? go look for the primary problem. If it's mild and the primary problem is gone, you're probably getting worth the money. Okay, next we're going to, now we're done with the fetlock. The fetlock has give, so give many changes. <laughs> no, it's with the horse the rest of his life. It's a permanent thing. Okay, next we're going to go into the carpus, and, and this is pretty brief. I'm just going to talk about um, just your anatomy here. This is the distal radius right here. This is the upper joint of the carpus. This is the lower joint. This joint doesn't open up and move. This is like a lower joint of a hock. So it's these two that open up and move when a horse flexes its leg. This on the back is the accessory carpal bone, which is basically a prop in the back of the joint. So here's a normal knee right here with no changes in this upper joint. Here's one where you can see the spur coming up here on the proximal intermediate and here on the distal lateral radius, and they're opposing each other. And the reason why I put this study up here is, is we were looking at accessory carpal bone fragments, and that's a fragment off of this bone that is articular up here because a lot of these horses will get a significant amount of spurring as they're trying to heal that fracture. Just like any fracture trying to heal, it creates inflammation, trying to heal it. So in this case, we looked at these, and actually the horses that had accessory carpal bone fragments with moderate spurring were normal compared to their siblings. I mean, they had the same number of starts and earnings per start and total earnings as their siblings. So this is a very forgiving joint. I think it's off, it, I mean, you can't sell those. For 
hardly anything. I mean, you guys know that. I mean, now I know, at least to tell my clients, if you have an accessory carpal bone fragment and has large spurs, race it. Um, don't give them away because it's worth more than what you're going to be able to get in a marketplace because people are going to value this as potential problems. And I think when you have spurring, you need to look at the force, the confirmation. Are they back at the knee? Are they offset? Things like that that are going to continue to affect the horse. So what do you guys think on spurs in the upper joint? Agree. Yeah, I agree. It, it anything, you mention anything in a knee and it affects the report. Right. Um, there's no question about that. And it's, it's uh, some very good racehorses have been purchased with this particular finding that go on and are fine. Okay. That absolutely, I would. I, I think there's, there's so much of a, I mean, things that are gonna negatively, that we know negatively affect sale, I think you have to because I think if you go to that panel, the majority of them are gonna say that, yes, this could negatively affect the horse. I don't think we have good data on the upper joint in the knee. We do on the lower joint. Usually they're fine, but occasionally they'll break off. The, the, the difference is in the upper joint, you can usually take them out and you're fine. So it's a different deal. The, the problem is, is the little bit of doubt raises people's um, doubt in people's mind of whether they will or won't have a problem in uncertainty leads to reduced price. So Debbie's right, the uncertainty usually works in your favor if you're buying. Okay. And then next we go to the lower joint of the knee, which again is right there. Um, that's the, the front or the dorsal aspect of the carpus. And, and back to looking at Kane's study, that was, very, that was significant. It significantly reduced the number of starts and earnings that these horses had. Um, this would be normal right here, and you can see this big spur coming off of the distal radiate carpal bone here. And the problem with these is when you need to do, when you have to do surgery, depending on how much joint surface is lost, um, they don't come back as well. You, yeah, I mean, that, that goes for yearlings, that goes for adults, that goes, I mean, you cannot give up joint surface here where you can for another horse. You can't, the horse always misses it in that location. Occasionally you'll have a really small one that they chipped off as a, as a foal and we end up taking out as a yearling that we've had them that have run very well. But it's, it's such a hard thing to sell because lower joints of the knees are such a concerning problem because they are very difficult. Horses are very hard on them in training and it's hard to come back from injury. So. Okay, now we're on to the hock. Um, this is the distal tibia. Here's the point of the hock or the calcaneus. This bone in here is the talus central tarsal bone, third tarsal bone, and cannon bone splint. Um, on the left, we have a normal hock, and on the right, we have a distal intermediate ridge of the tibia OCD. You see this is actually a fragment, it's a true OCD, and these do very well. This is the most common area to have OCD, and they do very well with removal. I think the majority of them do become clinical. I'm seeing a lot of them become clinical right now in prepping, but the majority when you get to breezing are gonna become clinical if they're not removed. And, and you did the study to show that they were normal. The, the hock's a very honest joint. Yeah. If, if you got a problem in the hock, you got fluid. And if, if you don't have fluid, it's okay. The thing about these pieces are that they don't start causing trouble, as Debbie said, till they get mobile. When they get mobile, the parent bone tries to heal them back, it sheds debris, just like an ankle tip. So take them out, they're fine, as long as the joint's normal looking. No fluid, you're okay. Okay, and next we just, I just want to show you when, when we're talking about spurs in the hock, this is the most typical spur you'll see is on the proximal MT3 or the third metatarsal bone, which is the cannon bone. They'll oftentimes have this hook up here. Um, most people are not concerned about that at all. I mean, mild ones, I don't really write. One that size, I probably would note on my report. Because you'd probably write okay behind it. Right, I mean, that's how I typically approach these. Um, but I would have a hard time saying that that's likely to affect his performance. It may, he may get sore in his hock, but that's typically the first thing that gets injected in a racehorse and they respond very well. So I don't think it's a reason to discount or be critical of. Now this one's a little bit different. Um, you can see normal on the left here with these lower hock joints. And then you can see this one is compressed and see how irregular these joints are. We'd always used to think that this was just premature foals. Well, anymore, I really think anything that has, um, that looks dismature, like the ones that are placentitis that come out, we radiograph 
when they're born or within a week before they ever do any exercise or get turned out to make sure that they are fully ossified on these bones. Because if they're not fully ossified, they can go ahead and compress, especially if they're very curvy. And even if they are term, look great, but they're very sickle hawk, I think then you need to radiograph them because oftentimes they will compress them just because the bones are soft when they're first born. <coughs> but these joints, as you can imagine, looking at this one normal, these ones wear faster in training. So you're not going to get as much out of your horse. And I mean, how do you think about that? And totally agree. <laughs> it is what it is. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> when you have irregularity in the joint surface, they don't wear well. So I've been more aggressive the last five or six years radiographing term foals with bad conformation. And it's amazing how many abnormal partial bones you see. And there's, it's, it's, it, every year it goes up in the numbers that I restrict in the, either a round pen or a very tiny paddock until, and I'll re-radiograph those and follow them along like on a weekly basis. And it's, I've, I've been impressed the last five or six years how many what you think would be normal tarsal bones that aren't. And I think that probably I've saved some from crushing. I think you, you definitely do. On ones that are real sickle hawks or cow hawks, you, I mean, I think you need to radiograph those and follow even, them Even though they're term. Yep. Mm -hmm. When, when your x-rays are okay? Yeah. When their x-rays are okay, and even, even I wait until their, their, their soft tissue component, their conformation improves too. I mean, usually their, their gluteals will get stronger. And then the confirmation improves. It's just like what Scott said. I mean, you can see it visually, but you do need to confirm it on the radiograph. The majority of joint mineralization, vast majority, 90% plus around the joints, takes place in the last month of gestation. So that tells you how far the horse has to come in the last month. And so if you're a little bit this mature, you got joints at risk. And, and uh, this, this is, um, the, the goose is either cooked or saved in the first month, usually, that the foal is around. And if it's cooked, it's cooked. Yeah. It no reversing it. Cooked for good. Okay, next we have stifle OCD. So this is the patella right here. This is the medial femoral condyle that we hear about often. This is your tibia. Here is the lateral trochlear ridge, which is the most common place for OCD. So this is normal. Here, the screen on the right, you can see this OCD here. It's actual fragment of bone. Um, and I did a study with Dr. Bramlage on this, and we looked at over 500 weanlings and yearlings that had had surgery on stifle OCDs. And actually, they do very well. I mean, if you look at the pictures on our walls uh, of champions and eclipse winners or whatnot, they are um, more stifle OCDs than anything else. And so we really wanted to look at it because this is something that significantly affects you at sale for the most part when they have a stifle OCD, even if they've had it removed, if the problem's taken care of, it still affects your price. So um, when I looked at this, I did different grades of how big the stifle OCDs were, multiple areas, and added all this size together. So horses that had just really zero to four centimeters of OCD did very well once they were removed. When you get larger than that, which four centimeters would be about from here to here. So a significant amount of the ridge. But you don't ha have just the lateral trochlear ridge. There's also the medial trochlear ridge in here, which I can show you on another picture. But it's that cumulative length and how much joint surface is really gone where that patella, where the kneecap, is going to glide. So when you got to four or six centimeters, they had decreased performance. And then more than six centimeters, again, decreased performance. But the interesting thing to me in this study was the ones that had the most, the largest lesions, actually their earnings per start were th was the same. So as the, their siblings, we looked at their siblings to compare them. So that tells me that there are some of those horses with really bad OCDs that do make it, and they make it at a high level. But they, they burn out fast. They just don't <laughs> race as much. But there, there are some. So, but generally, I mean, if it's a three centimeter OCD, you're getting drastically reduced on price. So I think that there's, that the biggest indicator to me is whether or not the fluid has resolved, how the horse looks clinically, but there are some of these that do, the majority of these do very well if they're not extremely large lesions. Any comment? I've got a comment. Go ahead. Um, it's hard to sell these. You, 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 you see, talking about the reports, you go in the back walking room, you see somebody, and you, you see it all the time, a buyer looks at the report, says stifle surgery, OCD, whatever. And you see, you, you can see the expression on their face. They walk. 
And it's unfortunate, and, it, and this is where I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit, it's unfortunate that more, I remember 20 years ago, that I think you operated on the worst stifles I've ever seen. It went to Europe, and it was a champion in Europe. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, how did that happen? That's not supposed to happen. This is good like, surgery. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but it was like, it was one of these huge, bad OCDs. It was like in three locations, and it was a champion in Europe. And Three-year-old? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, it could run. But what bothers me a little bit as a veterinarian and also someone in the business is that you get to the point we operate on so many of these horses, and he does them, and, the, and Ruggles and all the other, Emberts and all the other guys, they do them, and they do they do awesome. They win Eclipse Awards, they're champions, blah, blah, blah. It comes time, we want to we want to disclose that so it helps you sell them, and all of a sudden everybody dries up. Nobody wants to disclose anything. And it's the best thing you could ever do, marketing, but then all of a sudden it hurts the breeding, residual, the mare, the stallion, et cetera. And if, if a few of those got out, it would be amazing. On you, All of a sudden you'd be selling a lot of stifle OCDs. When you talk about, uh, you know, in this study of 518 horses, there were only 12 siblings, and there was only, and this was over a 10-year period, and there was only 12 siblings in the whole study, and none of them had more than two. You mean siblings where? That were in the study that they were out of the same mare. Yeah, so there were 12 pairs. Yes. 12 pairs in the study, so. So it's pretty, I mean, it was much lower than I thought it would be, because I think we all think, you know, you have this mare and, and it, it, you know, you have the stifle OCD recur year after year, but from this study, I couldn't show that at all, which was interesting to me. It may not be to you guys, but. Okay, I just want to show you some different stifle OCDs and sizes. So here's a real small one. This is about two centimeters, less than two centimeters here. These do very well. This is a larger one. See from all the way down here, all the way up here. So this is like more to your four centimeter range, and this one also looks very deep. The, the depth doesn't, I mean, it looks really bad, but honestly, the depth usually means it's off to the side and not right where your patella rides, so it doesn't necessarily affect you as much. It's the amount of um, the joint surface that you really have to use. But here's one thing to say. These do terrible if you leave them in. Yeah. If you've got a flap, a mobile flap that's in there. Now, everyone's going to say, oh, I had osteochondrosis and they healed. Those were osteochondrosis, not osteochondritis desiccans. Once they form the flap, they shed debris and they grind the joint up in a big hurry. They do terrible left in. And so this is one where surgeons really can make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next we have um, the dreaded medial femoral condyle cyst, which, I mean, if you've had one, here's the medial femoral condyle of a horse. Here's one with this, let me get my little circle up there, the big circular lucency, which is considered a subchondral bone cyst. Um, Dr. Sandler did a paper with Dr. Bramledge um, years ago in 2002, I think, with AEP, that what they looked at was, you know, they looked at the size of the cyst at the joint surface, because this is a weight-bearing surface, so you would think that the amount of joint surface involved is significant, and they also looked at the depth, and it was interesting that it was the amount of joint surface involved that affected performance, and not the depth. So depth didn't make any difference, just the amount of surface involved, and if they were less than a centimeter and a half, but with, this is with surgery, 70% of those horses raced. Raced. They raced later, but they did race well. But over a centimeter and a half, it's like having a flat spot on your tire. You can't really make that condyle round again doing anything. This is where surgeons can't help. <laughs> If the, the size of the lesion on the joint surface is what made the difference to the horses. And I think that's probably true no matter how you treat them. Um, so. Okay. so is there any promise on those for, with any other treatments besides surgery? Or there's well, stem cells are a little bit too early. Um, you can make the horses sound by putting steroids in them, but, but I think a large number of those reoccur. Um, the, the thing you do with surgery is, and if you look real close right here, are you going to talk about those? Lucency? Lucency. Talk about those first, and we'll come back. Okay, okay. Um, so me, you also, not all of them are cysts. Sometimes we'll talk about a medial femoral condyle lucency, and this would be a normal medial femoral condyle here. Here's one that has a lucency, and on these, I mean, you can see that the lucency is deep. It's not circular shaped like the cysts. 
but you can see that there's more white bone around here, which is sclerosis, which means inflammation, which means that horse knows it's there and it is inflamed. Um, for me, I look at these more on, again, the length of the lesion, but some of these mature away and some become cysts and some I stay about the same. I mean, it's, it's really hard to know where you're gonna be, say, if you're buying it for a two-year-old training sale. And there was a study that Dr. Whitman did and looked at horses that had lucency from medial femoral condyle, horses that had cysts, these are from repository, and then the horse in front of them on the catalog page. And they compared them, they considered the horse in front of them, um, their controls, and there was no difference in starts, earnings, and the earnings per start on these horses, which is far different than what we found in like the medial femoral condyle paper, you know, I'm the looking, but they were lame. Yeah, the paper did we surgery. did, they were lame. They'd already, once yep. they go lame, you're usually in trouble. But yep. fortunately, we wouldn't have many horses if every one of these lucencies in the spring surveys became clinical later because it's, the incidence is pretty high. But fortunately, if it stays intact, if it stays in osteochondrosis and the surface never gets disrupted, they will eventually heal that bone out. I mean, these are nothing but a bruise. It's a bruise to the growing bone. And this is a very high l level of activity, especially in horses starting about six months of age up until a year. You know, we see higher incidence of all stifle OCDs in horses that come out of the, the weanling sale because they've been prepped heavy, they restricted exercise, they go to the weanling sale, you get them home, you tranquilize them, and out they go. And they pound the hell out of their bones, and then they get these kind of bruises. So you have to be cautious when you put those horses into exercise. But if you just bruise it and you never disrupt the surface, they can mature away and they're fine. But if you crack through the joint surface, what happens is it looks like, it acts like a one-way valve. When the, the, the meniscus is here, so it's sealing the margin of this joint. Can you back up, Debbie, for mm -hmm. your other slide? Yeah. It's sealing the margin of the joint. So you got joint fluid in here, so every time you step down on that, if you got a crack in that articular cartilage, it pushes it up into the bone. And you keep pushing that fluid up into the bone and pressurizing the cyst, the bone just absorbs away. That's why it forms the cyst. Bone hates intermittent pressure. It'll absorb away. So if you're lucky enough that it never cracks through, the horse will be normal. Once you break through the surface, if it's small, you're okay. If it's very big, you get a flat spot on your tire. And then it's hard to keep in sync. So, so I still think, I mean, these, and, and we know this from sale, that these carry significant risk because you don't really know. They're hard for me to hand. I mean, I, I, they're I hard, hard for me to hand. handicap. I've been fairly lenient with them because they're, you know, many times it's, that's the only thing on the radiograph and you go, and Debbie and I kind of disagree on the amount of sclerosis and I think that's from coming from you mainly. Um, she's but right. I know, <laughs> of course she's right. But it, it, these are hard for me to handicap a little bit. The, the problem is if it goes against you, it's bad. You just usually eat the horse. There's no good, back, good backup. Maybe, maybe stem cells will be it one day, but I'm skeptical. Sorry. Okay. Um, just a few more slides. And this is, I just also wanted to go over past burns because that wasn't going over in that study that Kane did that looked at a lot of yearlings. But we did a study looking at pastern cysts. Okay. So here's the long pastern bone. Here's the short pastern bone. This is about all you'll see of the, I mean, you don't see the coffin bone, which would be down here um, on films in the repository. So this is P2, this is P1, we'll see cysts here and here on the condyles and the facets of P1 and P2, we'll also see lucency centrally. When Dr. Vargas did this study, and there was 180 horses in this, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty good study, but we showed that horses that had the lucencies here on the condyles and facets, it did not make any difference. They, had the, they were equal to their siblings. So that was a really good finding because we knew that these did okay, that's why I wanted to study because I've seen so many of them go on and do so well but we didn't have the data. And when you tell someone it has a cyst and a pastern, it's very concerning, you know, from when you're talking with someone. And then central lucencies we, we discussed in that, in that, those ones were significant, which we've always felt that those were not significant. So it's, that well, I still don't understand. But we think that's probably because they were only noted in the reports when they were big, because we thought the little ones were not, not much of a problem. And so, uh, it was a surprising finding, but I think size does make a difference. 
Okay, and then lastly, I have a picture just of a, a pastern avulsion. Now, there's some important ligaments that come down from the sesamoid and come all the way down to T2 here. Um, this superficial flexor comes down here, attaches to the middle, and I mean a superficial distal sesamoidian ligament. The superficial flexor, the tendon, comes around from the back and attaches here on the top of T2 on each side. This is a large avulsion of the superficial distal sesamoidian ligament, and this you know, we don't have any data on this, but this is something that you, you go to your clinical picture. I mean, this is the primary support to the back of the pastern, and these typically become very sore, or sore in training, or I've had them become sore in prep, so I've had a difficult time with these ones. And there's nothing you can do. Again, it's a ligamentous attachment, and it's an important structure to the pastern. So. Okay, finally, all the radiographs are done. Well, I think what it points sleep. out is, uh, I had a good friend of mine, we were residents together, and he said, uh, what you can remember is your first one, your last one, your best one, and your worst one. Now, I think we were talking about horses whenever, <laughs> <laughs> whenever that happened, but <laughs> your memory is really finite, and so you will remember spectacular failures and spectacular successes. Everybody remembers them, but you really got to look at the overall numbers if you're going to hedge your decisions in the right direction. And as far as the radiographs, there's so much variation on all these lesions. I mean, I showed you stuff that's very visible, you know, 50 feet away. There's a lot of things out there that may be significant that aren't that visible, and there, there's, very, there's varying degrees of severity on most all of these lesions. How it's written on a report is not always going to tell you exactly how significant it could be. All right, before we close, does anybody have, a, have any other questions? You got one right? On the base desmoid chair? Fragment? The middle distal sesmoidian ligament fails. It's the it's question. the oh uh, to repeat the question what about those fragments on the bottom of the sesamoid? Yeah, the 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 most important ligament is the middle distal sesamoid. The the superficial distal is important as well. That's the one that goes down, and that last piece that Debbie had over here. But it but in, if you're playing the odds, it's the middle distal sesamoid ligament, the one that's right in the middle of the bottom of the sesamoid. You pulled some of the fibers out in order to create that piece. There's some of the fibers left. If you got enough, the horse is fine. And there have been some champions with pieces under the sesamoid. You know, I, you don't throw them all away. But the numbers would indicate that they have problems with those. I mean, the, the data we looked at. And I think the, the difference in the data is you just can't train them as hard to make them high-quality horses. There are some earners in there. Question. Uh, on these joints that have had surgery, as an example, let's use a P1 chip that was removed. And the uh, repository films of that joint, you know, everything's got nice, smooth, happy, homogenous bone. But there's a deficit in that P1 where that chip was removed. How would you represent that joint on a report that you are writing for a consigner? And, oh. this, and you have a, there is a surgery certificate in the repository. If I did the surgery, I would have made notes in the surgery report and I'd represent it as normal for racing because we've got the data to prove it. Right, so but would you, how would you describe the, re the joint on the written report that the consigner oh, has at the barn? Um, NSA, no significant abnormalities. If there's a surgery report in there that says it had surgery, there's no reason, I mean, there, there's data to show that those do are, are normal. They basically are normal, and even if there's a defect, it's the same. So I would consider it no significant abnormality. So when it's a ride under a uh, surgery report, you still know it's a normal for racing and normal. Even if it's not right. If I, if I looked at the radiographs, yes, I'm not going to change how I report the post surgery report. If I looked at the radiographs and saw inside the joint, if I I saw the radiographs before sale. The reason that I think I have to look at radiographs before sale is there's a long time between when you did the surgery and now. And I look like an idiot 
if I report it normal for racing and the horse broke a sesamoid while in between time. He says, so if you look at the radiographs before sale, uh, you know, when, when the sale radiographs are taken, and they look the same as the ones that you did the surgery on, normal for racing, as far as my opinion. We got the data to prove it. And he saw inside the joint. I think from reading films, that's the hard part, is because you weren't the one to see inside the joint. So I think it's, it's nice to have that bit of information. OK. We'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. Thank our, thank our panel. <laughs>